Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the kickoff session of CRISPR-Con 2020 virtual. I'm Julie Shapiro, Director for the Natural Resources Program and Emerging Technologies Program at Keystone Policy Center. Keystone is a third party nonprofit, non advocacy organization that has spent 45 years helping to bring diverse perspectives to bear on decision making in areas of food and agriculture, natural resources, health, education, energy, and more. Our mission is to inspire leaders to reach higher common ground. Keystone Policy Center is based in Keystone, Colorado, which is the traditional homeland of the Ute people. We're proud to help facilitate CRISPR-Con's conversations on science, society, and the future of gene editing. The mission of CRISPR-Con is to create a unique, a unique forum of diverse voices across a variety of applications of gene editing in health, agriculture, conservation, and more. CRISPR-Con is about conversation, not consensus. We aim to highlight many perspectives and experiences, spark curiosity, build understanding, and share societal histories and other contexts relevant to decisions on gene editing technologies. 2020 is CRISPR-Con's fourth year. In the virtual format, we have 10 webinars and five themes over two months, plus additional discussion through our participant-led ideas marketplaces. Throughout the entire series, we have a broad ranging lineup of speakers and topics. We know we can't hear from everyone, but we do hope our lineup helps to demonstrate the diversity of voices and issues that are part of the conversation on gene editing. This week's theme is science and societal narratives, exploring how issues are framed, whose stories and perspectives are included in the discussion, and how these decisions impact our collective understanding of what's at stake and how to govern emerging technologies. Today, we'll discuss what stories are told by journalists. And on Thursday, September 3rd, we'll focus on indigenous perspectives that have been historically marginalized within discussions and decisions on genetics and society. We want to thank our partner in this first session, Innovative Genomics Institute. Its thought partnership is invaluable. The first CRISPR-Con was held in Berkeley in 2017, and it only seems fitting to partner with IGI on this first CRISPR-Con 2020 session as we embark for the first time virtually. We also wanna thank our sponsors for supporting the mission of CRISPR-Con and our ability to create these important conversations across diverse voices. Sponsors for this session are Corteva and United Soybean Board. You can learn more about this week's partners and sponsors and access featured past CRISPR-Con content in our expo. And we hope that the dialogue will bring out lots of lively discussion and debate among panelists and participants. Please use the stage chat to submit questions for the panelists at any time during the panel conversation. Divergence and disagreement are welcome. Please be empathetic, curious, engaged, and respectful as you listen and share across various perspectives. A reminder that there are also networking and small group discussion opportunities to carry on the conversation this week. And now, at this time, I'd like to invite our panelists to join us on screen, and I will turn things over to our moderator for this panel, Ting Wu, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, where she is also a member of the Wies Institute Director of the Consortium for Space Genetics and also Director of the per Personal Genetics Education Project. Panelists, go ahead and share your audio and video to join us in the conversation of gene editing and journalism. What story, whose story, and why? Okay, I think, I think we're on. Um, first, I really do want to thank the CRISPR-Con team this is year four. I remember when um, CRISPR-Con got started four years ago, the kinds of conversations we had there, I think were influential for so many people and so encouraging to think that conversations can help us address things we did not well uh, address well in the past and to help us weather um, challenges that we have coming forward. So it's great to be back with CRISPR-Con and I hope today we will be able to uh, stick to the spirit of CRISPR-Con, the con meaning conversation, and that we'll have a lot of good um, audience participation. The panelists are here to answer your questions more than mine, so please don't hesitate to jump in and send your questions on. But before I get started, I want, would like to thank the CRISPR-Con team. In particular, you just saw Julie, Julie Shapiro, Mallory Huggins, Brianna Brumbaugh, Rachel Helbig, Marcus Chavez, and Joanna Gibbs. It was um, quite a, a tour de force to get us all together in this way on such short notice. So with that, let's see, we can uh, meet our obligation and get some important topics covered. 
I thought I'd start by um, sharing with you some ruminations that I had as we approached today. I was thinking about how scientists and journalists might share some aspects of how we run our lives. And I started off thinking about how we scientists and journalists um, are attracted to puzzles and challenges. And we want to understand those puzzles and challenges. And we have to sort of work with what we have to try and move our understanding forward. And how sometimes that sort of activity um, leads to uh, insights and how the world might work or how we think the world works. And then our, our goal, our desire to try and share what we've learned with the community with a long-term hope of helping our society and, uh, and humanity. That, so those thoughts are kind of lofty and I got into the lofty room of thinking and really those goals apply to so many different walks of life. I mean, I think we've seen for the healthcare workers and the, those who are fighting, fighting fires that um, the desire to try and help, help our society is a common one and we all face challenges. So then I thought, well, okay, that, those are really good, big, big goals. But what about our daily lives? How, how similar are scientists and journalists at the mundane daily, on our daily fair? And I, I came across three words that I thought would be familiar to all of us and probably many people in the audience. And the first is deadlines. The number of times I have to write an email to my lab saying, I've got a deadline today. I'll deal with it as soon as it's over, is, is countless. So in the lab, um, of course, at the, at the bench, there are deadlines too. We, have, we do time course experiments where we have to assay something every, every few months. For agriculturalists, sometimes it's every few years. Sometimes our timelines are in the order of days, uh, hours, minutes, seconds. I have some instruments in my lab that and their, their time frame is milliseconds. Um, Deadlines that I write emails about have to do with submitting grant proposals on time. I'm not, I'm not a particularly on-time person, so deadlines are a big word in my life. When I go to conferences, I'm told, you will have seven minutes and 35 seconds to give your presentation. You have two minutes and you know 15 seconds to answer the questions, and they have a timer in front of you with green lights, yellow lights, and red lights to tell you how much time you have left, and sometimes when you hit the red light, a buzzer goes off. So deadlines are a big part of our life. And I, I think they must be for journalists. The other or the second word is surprise. So in science, um, surprise is, is a great thing. Sometimes it comes at a time when you're not ready for the surprise. It takes a little while to get used to what the data are telling you. But overall, surprises are so illuminating in what we're doing. That doesn't mean they're always welcomed, but they're illuminating. And um, I will say it is, if we're lucky, surprises can be a daily fair. Sometimes they tell you, if you're surprised too often, that you've had an idea too long and you've been staying a path for too long to be surprised constantly. It's a, it's a wonderful part of our life. The third word is critique. So in science, we count on our colleagues to critique us. It is never a perfect and all-encompassing critique. Critique comes from people, people have biases, but we count on our closest colleagues and our best friends to give us the toughest critiques. And we, we need that in order to do our science well. Again, like surprises, they're not always the most welcome thing to come into our life. It hurts sometimes to be critiqued, but in the long run, we weather those critiques were better. So, I'd love to ask our panelists, our journalists, about those three words. And I've asked them already to see if they can give us really concrete, anecdotal, detailed um, renditions so that we can have a much better gut feeling for what it's like to be a journalist and what you deal with. Deadlines, surprises, and critiques, you must handle those things. I thought I'd start with, with Elliot Kirshner from CBS Fame. Sunday morning, evening news, and um, an award-winning book called What Unites Us. It was written with Dan Rather, um, who is an icon, of course. Um, I grew up listening to Dan Rather. So, Elliot, when you were working with Dan Rather, mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you knew him very well beforehand. I think you did have interactions with him. 
beforehand. Were, uh, were you working on a deadline? Um, or was this one of those experiences as a journalist where you could take your time? And as you worked with him, were there surprising moments where he would say something or he would respond to something you said that was so unexpected that you found yourself changing the course of your conversation or your point of view? And did you ever critique him? And did he ever critique you? And how did that, how did that go? It's a lot to, but thank you. And thank you everybody for, for hosting this and we're happy to be here. Um, it's a lot to unpack there. I mean, I think that, I mean, there are deadlines. There always are deadlines, um, but journalism comes in many forms and different forms of journalism have different deadlines. And so even at CBS News, I worked at the evening news where deadline was, you know, often a matter of hours to put something together. I worked at 60 Minutes where we had months to do investigations or other times when you had to turn it around very quickly. So I think that the question is really, um, and, and in some ways I think journalism has been hurt by a different type of deadline, a nanosecond deadline, a digital deadline, a Twitter deadline. Um, you know, I think that's something that uh, that Dan often bemoaned and working with him is, you know, he came up in the time of newspapers and I mean, the deadlines in, in some sense have been shrunk and shrunk and shrunk. and what we lose in that is perspective. And I think, you know, actually my father's a scientist, so I grew up around science and I saw a very different set of deadlines. I saw, you know, postdocs take a long time to finish projects and grad students. And, you know, I think that, so I think that there are deadlines that are natural and deadlines that are artificial. Um, and it's, uh, you know, sometimes the nature of the publishing beast requires it. Um, but I think often some of the best journalism is the one that is allowed to escape deadlines, that's allowed. And it, it's a it's a rare journalistic organization these days with the economic pressures that they face to allow that. You know, deep digging, long-term investigations can be very expensive. Like science, they can sometimes lead to dead ends where you spent months or years on you know very expensive process. So um, you know, so I think that's a, that that was a real question. As far as as far as surprises, you know, I think that what journalists and the best journalists I would say and the best scientists have in common is skepticism. Um, Dan would always say, you know, skepticism, not cynicism, but that to be skeptical of conventional wisdoms, to be skeptical of what everybody of group think, what everybody else believes, to really not be afraid to challenge one's own assumptions. And I think that that is the, the root of surprise. If you, if you're, if you're open to trying to test something that's long a long-held belief and you know time and again we've seen that in science that science mar marches forward in terms of the horizons of knowledge by by challenging assumptions and it can come from any forms you know in many different places as far as criticism i would argue that one of the you know i now work in an organization called iBiology, which is a, you know does a lot of science communication from sort of the world of science mostly mostly staffed by scientists trained scientists. And I think science does a lot better job of dealing with uh, with criticism as built into the form than journalism does. Uh, there's a lot of, and you could just go on to, you know, Twitter or something like that to see some of the thin skinness of journalists. And especially there's a lot of competition between journalistic organizations traditionally that that makes, you know, criticism have its own costs. But also, you know, but there is also has been a self-policing notion to journalism that that journalism should be challenged although these days you know so much of what we hear is is so factually inaccurate or skewed uh in terms of of what's allowed to pass or or even more importantly you know lacks context that i do worry that that sort of review process has been has been diminished hmm. that's um maybe we can come back Scientists are always asking ourselves, well, can we critique better, be more honest, be more un un unbiased, and yet still m keep the spirit of science going? And we can come back sometime and, and uh, pursue, that, pursue that question. Um, I just so, so the audience knows, please feel free to ask questions anytime. I should have said this earlier. The panelists and I discussed earlier on that we are strong proponents of interruption. If you have an important question, every, all the panelists can see the questions. They could stop on you know on a dime and answer your question they may interrupt each other and even interview each other in front of you we really want to have 
a true multi-way conversation. Um, all right, so Antonio, I thought I'd go to you next. Um, Antonio is here with us from the MIT Tech Review. He's also written, uh, his articles have appeared in Science, in the Wall Street Journal. And um, Antonio, I feel I know you because uh, you've interviewed quite often my husband, George Church. And uh, I do know you're on deadlines because sometimes I will get a text from someone who says, where's George? Antonio needs to find him and, and I will find, um, I will help them find, um, find George. So Antonio, you are um, so well known for your investigative prowess. You have an intuition. Um, I think everyone recognizes for knowing when a story needs to be um, uh, where more digging is necessary. And so uh, first I wanna thank you for doing that. It's great. Um, and I also would love to ask you though, to tell us a bit more about what it's like. So I'm gonna come up with a, a fake scenario. You can tell me if it's not realistic at all, but I'm imagining because you do a lot of um, interviews and you investigate so thoroughly what you're studying, that there will be moments when let's say there's a five o'clock deadline You've investigated um, a topic such as gene editing, and you've talked to maybe a dozen people, and your story um, is just about done in your mind. It's three o'clock. You reach one last person you want to talk to, and lo and behold, in that conversation, that person says one thing that flips you 180 degrees, or maybe 90 degrees, but it it really throw, throws you a um, curveball. And what do you do with that and the deadline? And of course, uh, let's throw, make it a little more complicated. You know that this new piece of information is um, going to be complicated to say exactly the way you want to say it. You might not say it perfectly, and that's going to open you up either because of the content itself or because of what you're saying to a rapid set of tweets and critique. How do you um, navigate that? You can just answer the question, you can bring in anecdotes. We just want to learn more about how you do things. Um, you know what, I can't hear. Hear me now? Yeah. I can't hear you. Thank you for the question. Yes. Uh, it's a big question with many parts. Um, first of all, when I call George Church your husband, it sounds like I'm on deadline, but I'm actually just putting the cherry <laughs> on top. The investigation, so to speak, has been going on for a long time. I already anticipate what he might have to say. And in the kind of journalism that I do, I don't necessarily want to let everybody know what I know until I'm I'm ready to publish. Because there's a phenomenon where some right. someone might want to get out of your out ahead of your news or some other journalists could find out. So um, I like to keep the cards close to my chest until I'm ready to play them. Um, so that's kind of the deadline. Um, I would say uh, Elliot mentioned uh, the rare organization that can afford to you know, employ journalists to do uh, investigative work um, or to spend time on stories. I'm lucky that I work for that kind of organization. It's backed by MIT. The technology review. So I really don't. I really don't have. Yeah. I mean, I do, of course, have deadlines all the time. But I, I don't feel that I'm deadline driven. I'm, I'm driven oh. by trying to find stories that are, you know, that are big and that are, are going to resonate. And if I can find those, then the deadline pressure is off. Of course, if some weeks passed and you know my last interesting story is, is in the rearview mirror, then then the pressure increases to to get another one. Um, you asked about a scenario where uh, somebody tells you something new at 3 p.m. and you're and you're going to a 5 p.m. deadline. Again, in in the organization where I work, there's it's not a newspaper. Um, we don't have to print something on trees, so you know I never have to press that publish button. I don't have to. I don't have to press it. Um, that. Yeah, and and a lot of times, uh, you know the the. Most often, there's sort of missing information that you wish you had, or maybe something comes up. But uh, in in writing news stories, often these imperfections, if you embrace them, they make the story better. So if I have a serious imperfection in yeah. my story, I might be inclined to put it in the first sentence, right? 
you know. Um, yes. <laughs> this is what I call, you know, weaving straw into gold. There's lots of opportunities to do that in journalism um, all the time. And I would say we recently uh, wrote a story about do-it-yourself vaccines for coronavirus. And this was a story that I was reporting. And I kind of had an inkling that George might be involved. But, you know, I didn't call him until the very end. So I had prepared this story. Um, and then when I found out uh, that George, your husband, was involved and actually had taken this nasal vaccine, uh, that really, that was sort of my 3 p.m phone call and it made the story much better because he's a recognizable character and it just made the story much more approachable um, and in a way more more important. Um, so that was a great 3 p.m. call. In terms of the critique, um, I'm most satisfied when I can present a series of facts, maybe surprising and astounding facts, uh -huh. and that people could take maybe opposite messages from the story. Some people might embrace the idea, for example, of do-it-yourself vaccines, and other people might have a very strong negative reaction. So I like it when the same set of facts that different people take opposite conclusions. Now, sometimes um, the reader thinks that, that I'm adopting one or the other of those conclusions, and I, I get attacked on Twitter for you know presenting this material without uh, putting in a strong critique of my own. You know, well, what do you think they want to know? Is it wrong or is it right? I much prefer to just, if I can lay out these facts and stoke a conversation, uh, I'm most satisfied when people can't actually discern what my opinion is. That's fun, so. That's, um, that's really interesting. I, one, I, I really, appreciate this insight into what, what you're doing, Antonio, because I, as I said, I feel like I've known you for 20 years, or a long, maybe 15 years. Um, one thing you said that I really love, it reminds me of what we do in the lab, you say when you see a weak point or something that's difficult, you tend to put it right up front. That's what we do in the lab too. I mean, in a way, as scientists, we don't have a choice. That's the fact. Those are the situations, you have to put it out there. So it's, sometimes it's complicated about how to fit it in, but that is the easiest and most satisfying thing to do, put it up right up front. And actually, we already have, um, tomorrow I'm gonna get to you, but we have our first question. So let me throw this question out, and tomorrow you can answer this one too. Um, or let's see, let me think about this. I'll tell you what, let's get tomorrow. Um, so all three of you have introduced who you are, and then we'll go to this first question. And uh, it's great to have a question this early on. It's a great question, actually, a great one. Um, all right, so Tamar, I met you um, for the first time in, in Zoom, in person, uh, just, just last week. And um, for those of you who have followed her, you will know that she works uh, on this beautiful column called Unearthed. Uh, it's an award-winning column. The, uh, with the Washington Post, and uh, that she has, I guess not so recently, but recently for many of us in our timeline, moved to the Cape where she is. She and her husband are really living off the land. You, I, I know you have this whole oyster farm, but I didn't know you also had chickens and other and other um, other organisms. So um, I also left you to the end because what you work on and what you write about food is probably the most universal essential thing that all of us have done for tens of millions of years and essentially every single organism has done, nutrition. And um, you, you're fearless in what you write. And um, I think it's so important for um, the communication to people of what, of what they eat immediately as, as, as discoveries are made. So I'd love to ask you the same three questions. I imagine when you're researching, nutrition, that you have come across quite a few surprises. Um, and how do you get those written in a short enough space to hit your deadlines? And then um, some of your articles have elicited critiques. You are no newbie to being critiqued in public. So I'm wondering uh, about your experiences there. And then, um, oh, another question. This is great. I'm wondering about your experiences and um, any any details, anecdotes will be welcome. 
Thanks. Thanks, Ting. And thanks for having me here. Um, it's great to connect with other journalists because, you know, we're all sitting at home in our underwear most of the time. So it's good to actually have contact. And uh, I think that the things that you're asking about, especially surprise and critique, are sort of common to journalism and science because we're both groups of people are heavily invested in trying to be right. And, you know, the thing that scares me about my job, and I'm an opinion columnist, so I, you know, I do express an opinion, um, it's, is getting something wrong. And, and the scientists are the same way, but because we're human, and you said it up front that, you know, people have biases, you know, including us. And so one of the, the thing that keeps me up at night is what are my biases and how are they impeding the way that I see the world? How, what am I getting wrong because of that? And so critique and surprise, I think they're, they're inevitable, they're good, they're healthy. Um, the key question is, is how you react to them because you know we're all heavily invested in our priors and when something new and fresh comes down the road, do if it if it conflicts yeah. with our priors, do we look for the you know the flaw in the study? And if it supports it, do we do we just take it on faith? And Elliot, you talked about skepticism, and I, I think that's key. And it's it's a question of how and when you engage that skepticism, because lots of people find it really easy to be skeptical of points of view they don't agree with. But, you know, when, I, when are you reflecting that skepticism back on the things that you believe? And one of the great things about my job is that it is, it is a, a, every month, and it's a monthly column, is an opportunity for me to change my mind. And that's sort of what I'm actively looking to do. So I'm looking for the critique. I'm looking for the surprise. And my MO is, okay, I've been writing about this stuff for 20 odd years. I have an opinion about most things. And when I sit down to write about it, the first thing I do is call the smartest person I know who disagrees with me and I just listen. I, I love that the, in our lab, we we will one day get some data and suddenly everything is different. I, I really do believe survival in science and happiness. Survival for me means, yes, papers, et cetera, but being happy in your daily work is the flexibility to, to um, switch. And I think there's a big correlation in um, being able to be flexible, to take surprise well, and uh, not letting your ego get in the way. Ego has a really big... It becomes a really big problem. All right, so, okay, here we go. So one, we're going to do, I have, we now have a number of audience questions. This is great. I want to let the audience know that we are um, really, I think I'm, I may have mentioned this, uh, interrupting is A-OK. -okay. We can change paths in the middle of a conversation. I can already tell Antonio is looking at the questions. I think people are looking at the questions. And our panelists, uh, are free to interrupt each other and interview each other. So here we go. First question from Guillaume. How do you choose life science researchers for quotes or comments? <clears throat> and how do you think those quotes will frame the debate? Oh, such a great question. I.e., quotes about genome vandalism or Cas9 wrecking chromosomal mayhem on mammalian embryos, in mammalian embryos. So yes, the quotes themselves can uh, ask for information that give a strong feeling, uh, overtone. I would say, let's start with Antonio on that one. I recognize uh, where the genome vandalism comes from. <clears throat> Speaking chromosomal mayhem, I don't know. The, these, are, the, these quotes can be very powerful. I, I'm going to want to bump this over to Elliot um, because since he's involved in making a movie, you know, people are actually speaking in the movie. It's kind of more important even to get the good quotes. I, I don't, I don't consider myself the journalist who is best with these spicy quotes, but they have a huge uh, consequence uh, because people can understand them and they kind of stick in people's minds. And um, in the, in this case, uh, the questioner uh, is providing like two different quotes, one of which. Is a, is a critique of CRISPR itself as being a tool that um, 
isn't all that accurate and needs to get improved. And then the other one uh, is coming from someone who's, I think, criticizing CRISPR babies, right? And that we should never do this to a human uh, embryo. And these quotes don't don't leave any room really for, or the latter quote doesn't really leave much room for a development in the technology. I mean, it's a statement that this technology destroys genomes. Um, but maybe it doesn't, or maybe it gets going to get improved. So how long is that thought going to be in our mind? But I want to I want to ask Elliot because I think he did much more work trying to get people to I mean, say things. Yeah, I mean Antonio is being you know is being, being modest here. I mean as one of the persons in our film, which is Human Nature, uh, which also featured George Church among many other voices, Antonio provided some of the best lines in. The movie, including his own line about a, a T-shirt and genome editing, and uh, so so he um, he was a wonderful find for us in the film, and 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 he's the reason why he was good. I think gets at the, at the central issue to this question, and I, I mean I think we should just lay it out. I think by and large the mainstream press uh, does an okay to poor job of covering science, and I think the reason that is. It's not that they get the facts wrong, although there are egregious examples of that or misunderstanding, but that most newsrooms I've worked in have nobody trained in science. And so what that what that means is that it, what we're missing is, is the spirit of science, the ethos of science. Science has its own has its own sort of community. And so you see people that covering the Middle East, they'll understand the difference between, you know, Hezbollah and Islamic Jihad. They'll understand the difference between the, you know, the factions in a state capital that those are those are those are worlds that a lot of journalists and especially editors who make a lot of the decisions about how things are covered or who gets interviewed they understand science which is as much about how it's done as as what's discovered there's a, there's a lack of understanding and i think what that means is you know you if you go to a a scientific conference there's so many different voices so many different challenging you know just because someone comes from a quote unquote prestigious institution doesn't mean that they're going to get a free pass for what they say. Uh, that is not reflected in the way science is often covered. You know, I would argue that the Rolodex for most general news reporters is too limited, too limited to certain institutions. You have a Harvard so-and-so or even an MIT or a Berkeley or Stanford that carries more weight, even though, you know, that's just, I mean, that's, that's just, not really true in terms of what that they, a person might have not have more weight than someone's a lesser known institution or a less prestigious quote unquote institution in terms of the field. So I think that that's a real problem. I, and then I think that this this level, you know, in our film in human nature, we really tried to we interviewed people as, as Antonio will attest and, and George Church will attest. We interviewed him twice for very long periods of time. And I think what we were looking for were not those gotcha sound bites. I mean, what, all that does is just sort of reinforce stereotypes. It, it makes a headline. People get pushed into their, their own views. You're not challenging the assumptions of, of the audience. And, and I think that, that, that it, it, what it comes from, it, I think a lot of the reason why those are picked is because the journalists or whatever who are covering these stories often as part of a much broader beat and the number of science journalists, has to, you know, science-focused journalists has been depleted along with newsrooms around, the, you know, in many ways that they're sort of looking for that quick hit, that quick headline, but they're not really advancing knowledge. And science knowledge is nuanced, it's complicated, it's overlapping, it's conflicting. I mean, Antonio's stories are replete with that as you know, a sign of just the real quality of the journalism that he does. And so I would argue that that these kinds of, of sound bites or, or quotes, I mean, what do they really provide? Are they really advancing the knowledge of the complexity of a field like genome editing where you know you can march off to your extreme camps, but is that really where most of the scientific world is? And the answer is no. And so, as a journalist, you have to you have to portray that world effectively, and you have to have to have that by understanding it. And that's why I think it's very very important that news organizations hire more people with backgrounds in science, so they could understand the nature of the debates and the nature of of complexity and skepticism and uncertainty, which all, which, which is what science is ultimately really about. Maybe I'll, I'll step in from the science point of view. I, this is such a critical point. I'm glad we got to it so soon. Why don't our graduate students and postdocs more than flock to working in journalism? Um, I'd love to know because I can tell you there's a lot of interest there in commuting communicating with the 
with the public that we serve. And somewhere along the way, um, that does not translate into a lot of people going there. But the other thing is I will say that um, I've worked um, through the Personal Genetics Education Project as part of my lab. We work uh, especially on trying to bridge the gap in understanding about genomics between the general public and scientists. I've been told, please make it short and make it simple um, because really, after all, what scientists do a lot, what we you know spend all our time thinking is not going to, to grip attention. And I, I understand that. You need to hold the attention of the people you're interacting with. Where is the balance? Because they all say, oh, that's, those, that's just nitty gritty things that you're, you're saying. What's the bottom line? How should scientists respond to, give me a bottom line in five, in five words, or should we not respond to that? Yeah, to me, I mean, I, mean, I think that, you know, I mean, I, I, well, I think that you should be very, you know, I mean, I, the reason why I think a lot of scientists don't go into journalism is partly because journalism jobs are really hard to come by. You know, I mean, if there were money, if there was, if there was money in journalism for science journalists, I think you'd see more scientists in science trained people in journalism. So I think that's a, a bit of a supply and demand question. Okay. All right. So we should all um, donate more money more. to, uh, to those radio. Or, or, or I, I really think that, or, or institutions <laughs> that support science research need to support science communication. I mean, it's, I think that that has to be part of the obligation um, that, that, you know, otherwise uh, you're, you're missing the, the conduit to the general public. That is so critical. And then there's no conversation. Tamara, you had a comment you wanted to make. Yeah, I guess I, I kind of specialize in eye glazing detail, um, both writing about agriculture and writing about nutrition. And I guess maybe I'm drinking my own Kool-Aid, but I, I think it's possible to write about things that are complex and advances that are incremental um, in ways that are engaging to an audience. And it's absolutely true that there are topics where it's just virtually impossible to, to, to hold people's attention. And if you've never written about the farm bill, then <laughs> you count yourself lucky. But I think that science, lots and lots of science, um, is relevant to people. Certainly in my area, food is very relevant to people. But also everything that's happening in gene editing is it's relevant to medicine. It's also relevant to food. It's relevant to health. It's relevant to disease. Um, right. And and I think that you can be both accurate and, and give the details their due um, and and focus on a message that's interesting and compelling to people. Now, you know, some people are going like, to pick up some of my columns and roll their eyes. Um, but, but I think that that's our job is to make it interesting. And some, if somebody says, you know, five words or less, okay, then you can push back. But it, Einstein is reputed to have said, and of course he's reputed to have said all kinds of stuff that he never actually said. So I don't know whether he actually said this, but he said, if you can't explain it to a five-year-old, you don't understand it yourself. And, and so, so much of what I do is crystallizing my own understanding and then trying to convey that to somebody else. You know, um, I read some of your columns. You are entertaining. Um, your turns of phrases are entertaining. Thank so you. I have a quick anecdote myself. And then we're gonna go on to the next question, which is very related to this. I was applying for a grant proposal and I gave it my all. I put my data in there, charts and tables, and, and I didn't get it. And the program officer wrote back and said, you know, I, I wrote back, what did I do wrong? Because you know, it's, take out half your data, just, just cut it in half. So I did, I took out half my data and I filled it in with lots of other stuff, sent it, I didn't get it. And I called him, I said, well, I took out half my data. He said, it wasn't enough. Take out more data. You didn't really hear what I was saying. So I took out so much data. He said, tell them the story of what you're going through. And I got it the third time. And I, I think your articles really capture, what your response just captures that. Thanks. All right, hey, so the next I have question. to ask you, Ting, have you seen A River Runs Through It, the movie? Oh. 
I have seen that. Because there's a scene <laughs> where the kid has to write an essay and he brings it in to Tom Skerritt and Tom Skerritt says, you know, it's great, but make it shorter <laughs> or cut it in half and then it, do it again. And then after that, then he can go out and fish. And it's, it's the same thing. You have to be able to distill it into something that is meaningful to your reader. I agree with you. Everybody should be able to understand. It's not whether people have the education to understand what we're doing. It's how we present it. All right, so here's another question. And actually the previous um, questioner added, related to this, how do you choose what is credible? Which fits perfectly in with the second question uh, from Kristen. Trust in the media has been slowly decreasing over the years. So credibility and trust. I would love to hear any personal examples. So this person wants personal examples of maintaining or building trust, especially when reporting on controversial topics. So I imagine these would be topics for which there are very different opinions of view. And um, all right, I will say, who would like to, to tackle it? Who has I a personal talk. example? Antonio. This question of trust. In approaching scientists to interview them, it is a great help to know something about what they do and to have taken the time uh, to have read their articles. Or even better, if they had a book, if you say, the first thing you say, yes, I read your book, and according to your book, blah, 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 you'll have won somebody over, right? So it is possible in science reporting to have a relationship of conflict with somebody, but because you have authentically you know, delved into their research, you could still have a reporting relationship with them. And there, there's, a, there's an example that I remember from my own reporting, a guy named Jose Sabelli, who was the first person to try and clone human embryos, right? Before CRISPR and CRISPR babies, there was a prior controversy, cloning, and would anybody clone a human embryo? And I have to say, you know, I was essentially persecuting this guy as, as a reporter, you know, trying to find out everything about him um, but interestingly enough, it developed into a relationship of trust that I knew enough about what he was doing that he could speak to me as he might speak to another scientist, even though I wasn't. Do you know what I mean? Like I had an appreciation for the subject matter, for the nuances, and that even though I had a kind of negative view of what he was doing, it was still accurate. And that was the most important thing to him. Well, I think it... it Scientists and journalists want to deliver as close to the pos as possible a true a true thing, and so we work together. Uh, so I can my personal anecdote just to follow, and then I'd like to go to Elliot. I think Elliot has something to say. Is uh, Antonio? You probably know that sometimes when someone says Antonio Regalado wants to talk with you, the response of the scientist is, "Oh," <laughs> but I would say George always looks forward to your interviews because you are completely aligned in trying to get the story out and information out. So, um, Elliot, did you have uh, a comment? Well, I mean, I think to pick up on what Antonio is saying, and uh, again, this is, goes to sort of a, a, a challenge to current journalism and the way that journalism is being done. I think when you have a essentially a beat reporter, um, I mean, Antonio is a very wide beat, so I don't want to you know narrow, but you build that kind of credibility. You build that kind of understanding that, you know, when, when Antonio calls up, he's, he knows what he's going to be talking about. You might not like the questions you're going to get, but you can't question whether he understands it. The body of work speaks for itself. So I think that that's a real challenge in the way science is often covered now in journalism. And again, I keep coming back to the decimation of newsrooms and, and how, how assignments are handed out. It's, it's a big problem that, you know, you build credibility with sources. As far as the public's credibility, I mean, there's so many, you know, that's a whole level, number, numerous other conversations we can have about eroding public trust in the media. This, you know, why I think that there's a cynical, you know, weaponization of that against the media for, for political or power purposes and stuff like that. But I do think that the public, and this is what we try to do in our film with Human Nature about CRISPR editing, is that I think the public's a lot smarter than some people in journalism or even in science think they are. And that, and, and I would really argue I that agree. in some sense, if you take, if, if the job is to communicate science to the public, you hear a lot of communicators or people doing the storytelling, blaming scientists for speaking, you know, too much jargon or the public with being too distracted. When of that group, only one of those, is the actual job is to communicate the science to the public. And so I think it's really important that, uh, that 
that science communicators, A, they listen to the public, they listen to scientists, and that they build that credibility with both groups. And I think it can be done. I think that the public, again, what, what our challenge was with this film was to do something that we thought pushed well beyond the boundaries of what conventional wisdom felt the public, the general public could, could afford uh, in terms of the complexity of the science we talked about. And that's why we, we raised funding independently instead of going through distributors, because we don't want to be hindered by sort of a conventional wisdom of what a science documentary should be. And, you know, it's going to be on Netflix. It's going to be on Netflix starting October 1st. There's going to be a special showing on Nova on September 9th, not to give it a plug. But I mean, I, I use that as data points for that. I think even though we we felt we might be overshooting the horizon of what, you know, sort of complexity and difficulty for a general audience was. We played many, many film festivals. The feedback we're getting, the data we're getting, is that the public really can engage with that. The public can, if if presented in a way that yes. that respects the public's understanding, you know, it, it puts a premium on storytelling. I think you can build credibility, and in a way too that you know we got a wonderful review in the National Review, a conservative publication, and so science also I think has an opportunity to be apolitical. I mean, there's some you know climate change and other things where it's become increasingly political. But ultimately, as you said, you know, when it comes to human health, I mean, these are things that touch everybody's, uh, you know, the awe of the cosmos. So I think that you can, that science journalism, if done right, can actually build, be a bridge for credibility for journalism more generally. Or well, I not. Think it's, it's, which has been my experience in biotech. Well, and yeah. you know, I think that, that um, and, and there are a couple of questions that hit on this peripherally about asking about whether, you know, journalists ever shy away from topics that are, uh, that are controversial. And, you know, you try and build trust, but there are so many issues and genetic modification is one of them, vaccines are another, there are a whole, there's a laundry list of them, where as soon as you come down on one side or the other, or, you know, just leaning toward one side or the other, there are, there are uh, advocates whose job it is to try and undermine your credibility. And I found that to be probably the most demoralizing thing I've ever experienced in journalism where, I mean, you can Google me and see what people say. I'm a covert Monsanto operative. I'm on the payroll. Uh, the academics, you know, conferences I speak at are all underwritten by, by, big corporations and and that's their line to me. And even, I mean, look at this. Julie said in the beginning that this panel is sponsored by Corteva and the Soybean Board, both people, both groups who are heavily invested in the success and the acceptance of gene editing. And so you can see how this thing, this tends to polarize people and it puts them in camps and it makes it very, very hard to break through and, and be trusted. Um, and it's frustrating when, you know, you spend your whole career trying to establish yourself as, as a credible source, somebody that people can feel safe listening to. But again, okay, so we're all super careful about what we write. Presumably we're here because there's some faith in the things we do. But let me ask the three of you, how often have you read something that's in your area of expertise, the things that you understand in a credible publication and found things that are pretty wrong? Well, the, this is called the, often? This is called the gel man effect, where you read, uh, you accept what you read in newspapers, but then when you read something about what you know, the, the article actually reverses cause and effect. So you're like, this is completely wrong. But then you'll flip the page and, you'll, and you'll accept that, that he had, yeah, he had. But then you'll flip the page and read something, you know, about fashion, not in your area, and you'll just accept that it is true. I wanted to to just jump in right. and follow up on a couple of other things and then get back to your point to Mark. First of all, do scientists have a platform to communicate? More and more, they're on Twitter. There's scientists who are taking over the conversation yeah. with Twitter <laughs> threads. And the journalists go to them, and the journalists literally, including me, quote from the from the tweets. Uh, there's a powerful new platform and a powerful new group of scientists. And I don't know if it uh, is get, you know, I don't know what tenure committees think, but this is a potent force, especially in the pandemic. I want to say that CRISPR, we should get to CRISPR. The reason CRISPR is good for journalism is it creates a story big enough mm -hmm. that everybody can write about it and, you know, delve into the details or whatever angle that they want. They're really just writing about biotech. It's an excuse to visit biotech. 
in 2020. To me, what CRISPR is. <laughs> Lastly, Tamar, something horrible is happening. It hasn't happened to CRISPR yet because I don't think Donald Trump has ever uttered the word CRISPR. He had nothing to say about the CRISPR babies. But with the pandemic, now suddenly biotech and science has been sucked up into this political conversation, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, incredibly interesting, that? but also excruciatingly stupid because there's only two sides. Every question has two sides, and they're political sides, like a conservative side and a liberal side, and which is which is excruciatingly dumb. Um, and and if Donald Trump says it's white, the entire science community is committed to getting the message out that it's black. Right. What, also, whether they're right or not, I mean, once Donald right. Trump exactly once he takes a side, then uh, you know people people can't update their own views. Because right, they don't want exactly. to agree. There was a tweet that I saw and somebody said it. I will not take a vaccine until Biden is elected. Well, I will not take a coronavirus vaccine until Biden is elected. I mean, that is something well, really to chew on. But and I think was, that you know, but, but I think for that, it's like, I mean, we have seen the politicization of the CDC. We've seen the politicization of the FDA. Mm -hmm. And so I think the question right. of can you I think that's a, can you trust what the government says about anything these days, about the safety or, or the truth about anything, I think is infected. And but I think that you know, I and I understand it all. I hear all this, and I agree with what you're saying about this politicization. I mean, I would argue that um, one of that, you know, I, I, that maybe if we take the long view, we might it, it might get a lot better. I mean, that that science still. I mean, if you look back over the last four years, what one event was the most harmonizing event, what brought more people together as a nation. And it was the solar eclipse. And it was something estimated that somehow over 200 million people in this country interacted with it in some way. And what I think that what we're missing about the story of science, and we try to put it in our film as well, is that yes, it's, it's relatable. Yes, climate change is very important. Yes, um, you know, medicine and how, what it means for human health. And that's what we're, that's what that's what people will, I think will tell you. And when you know when you get media training in science, that you should talk about that, make it relatable to what the public cares about. But we are missing the story of awe and wonder of discovery. That that is that is a unifying human principle. What is it like to go beyond the known, over the horizon? It's why space travel and space exploration, I think, has been a very unifying principle. But what we're missing in the life sciences is that same idea of of exploring the wonders of the microcosmos as well as the macrocosmos. And that that idea, you know, and as far as sort of is bringing the public together to, to uh, I mean, that's what's driving most of science. It's what's driving basic research. We don't tell the stories of basic research. We don't understand, the public doesn't understand what drives that, 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 that pursuit of knowledge for knowledge is safe. And I think there's a real fault in the way that everything is reduced to what the utility is in some, obscure sort of predefined sense of, of, of every, that every scientific discovery has to be what it means for diabetes or Alzheimer's or some disease, especially in the life sciences. And I think that if we sort of jettison some of that baggage, if we, if, if the stories and the storytellers push beyond that, yes, we're going to be mired in the politics of the moment, but we have to, you know, it is the world. It is, it is what it is, as people have said, uh, that we need to try to find ways to portray what science is really about. And I do believe, and maybe it's my own optimism, that that most people will rally to that, 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 that there's, a, there's a rallying cry just for how cool it can be. And I just, if you, I think if you go to the pages of the major newspapers or even on television, that story of science is not being told. So I'm going to, this is a great conversation. I have a comment. Um, I want to read very quickly through a lot of the questions that have come in. And Mallory has actually um, summarized it. A lot has to do with this trust issue, trust, trust, trust. So let me go through them really quickly so the audience can see what questions are coming in. And then I'd like to come back to this idea of the long view. And maybe, maybe the long view is uh, something we need to discuss. All right, so let's start. Um, there are a series of questions from Daniel. What do you think the press got right in reporting on the J.K. Ha affair? What did it get wrong? Why do you think media reporting on CRISPR overall went quiet? 
as JK, as the affair, uh, JK Club affair died down. From Francine, how would you describe the lens through which journalists generally view scientific developments and new technology? So they're asking, how are you looking at it? From Marcy, how would you assess journalistic coverage from the human of uh, human gene editing, especially heritable gene genome editing? What's strong? What's what's wrong? Or what's missing? What's strong? What's missing? How can you talk about how you come up? Can you talk about how you come up with your story ideas? So I think people are asking about you personally. There's a bias right there trust for you what do you how do you write do journalists hesitate and avoid writing against popular perception on biotech from um kishan i don't understand why reporters journalists need to include radical viewpoints or other people's opinions of the information why not just report the facts and let people form their own opinions um might be good to con let's see how do you determine who what is credible i don't understand why oh, okay Trust and credibility of journalists, not just with scientists, but with the public, which has diverse perspectives. Okay, another question on credible, radical, fringe, trust. Um, can I take Can I take that one? Yes, let me um, set the stage a little bit. I'm just gonna broaden it a bit. Um, and maybe tomorrow then you can follow on this because um, I'm gonna ask all three of you whether, of course, in the moment, right now we see what's going on and we're judging whether it's good whether it's bad but maybe um as elliot says if we think a hundred years from now we look back at this moment are these debates and moments of distrust and moments of enlightenment and moments of tiny moments of trust what we have to go through to get to a more general sense of i understand where you're coming from i mean do we is this the argument prior to an under a, a more global understanding. So Elliot, I agree with you, moments of wonder, but sometimes those moments of wonder, the interpretation are followed by a lot mm -hmm. of skepticism. And maybe this is just what we have to do. We have to fight about this and critique each other and have the memory that we got up and we just attack this journalist and that journalist came back and continued to write and actually incorporated something they learned from the fight to build trust. All right, so I'm gonna put that there. Um, we're gonna to continue to talk about this tomorrow. So to, to, to tackle the, the larger question that, that you just raised, um, my answer is a resounding, I'm not sure at all, because I mean, technology marches on and I actually think that what's gonna de determine how we accept gene editing um, as a society is probably going to be more predicated on whether it does anything good for us that people perceive as good for them than any arguments that, that we're having about it. And I, I think that technology marches on eventually, it does something that people want, and then it just becomes part of our lives. And but I think this idea about radical and fringe ideas and, and why this question about why do journalists include radical and fringe ideas in like there was the was it the John Oliver skit about climate change and including the, you know, the three guys who said it wasn't happening and then the 97 guys who said it was. And um, I, I think that as a journalist, first thing you have to make a decision about is whether an opinion is beyond the pale. Is it something that you just won't include when you talk about this topic? And there are opinions that are beyond the pale. Um, you know, I think we can all agree on, on the efficacy of vaccines, for example. Um, nobody's going to include the, the flat earth perspective. Um, but I think that, that, Beyond the Pale has a bad case of mission creep. And we tend to think opinions that differ from ours, perhaps in radical ways, and perhaps are allied with opinions that are beyond the pale, are also beyond the pale. And in every topic I cover, I think I can find um, reasonable reasons uh, that the thing I believe is incorrect. And 
and I always want to include those when when I write about it. But uh, again, I get to write about opinion. But I would make the case that anybody who doesn't write about opinion, who just writes about factual presentation of controversial issues, as a journalist, you have to decide what you believe to be true before you can make a, a, a choice about which opinions and how are they weighted in your piece? Because you can't fall into the both sidesism question. But, but I would say here, so, I think science journalists that cover science have a real advantage because science itself is a nature of weighing in the truth. And so, you know, a, a lot of other stories, kind of topics I've covered, it's very complicated to sort of figure out, you know, what's what's real and what isn't. But you can, you know, and and not it's not to say that there haven't been some you know, some wild beyond the fringe ideas in science that have proven to be true. So, I mean, I think the scientific community is, is alert to that and, and needs to think about that. But you really can tell, like, what's junk science and what isn't, by and large. And that I think the responsibility of a journalist is to is to be within that understanding of what the general consensus is with uh, of the scientific community. And when one has a reason to stray beyond that. And we made a big decision in our film not to do a lot of the DYI sort of, you know, gene hackers and because we didn't think that was a responsible and, and accurate portrayal of what, where this is really heading. Um, but if one does go beyond that, what scientific consensus, that must be noted and that must be, there must be a reason to do that other than shock value or entertainment value or or you know, or a great character that that the responsibility should be on what you know what's been peer reviewed, on what's been what, what's been processed. And as I said, and I think tomorrow you make a right case that there are times when you really need to go beyond that. There's a reason. There's a storytelling or a journalistic reason to stray beyond that. But then that is the responsibility mm -hmm. of the journalist to explain that and contextualize that in their reporting. And I think that that often doesn't mm -hmm. happen. So you. Um have said this word responsibility. I'd like to, there's so much we can say, we can continue. There's so many avenues we would go down, but I'd like to grab onto this moment, responsibility, read one question and then turn our conversation to our big responsibilities right now to society, some of our big responsibilities. So Kevin says, <clears throat> when covering topics with central characters or topics that are based out of other countries, how often do you try to capture another country or culture's point of view? Do you find it difficult to interview people internationally? <clears throat> if so, does this lead to an American-centric point of view that is difficult to expand? And Kevin, if you'll permit me, I'll say even within our own country, there are many cultures. How hard do we try to capture those cultures' point of view? Um, what's our responsibility? And now I'm gonna back up one more and go to the word surprise, and hopefully we can tie this all together. So, um, so many things have happened this year. And I've seen a whole range of responses. You'll have some people say, who would have guessed the world and the nation, our community, my family is in its current situation. Who would have guessed a year ago that we'd be doing what we're doing? Uh, comments about, I, I never would have believed that all these changes would have happened. And I'm talking both about climate change. I'm talking about political situation. I'm talking about the pandemic. I'm talking about um, the unrest we have in the nation uh, over disparity, not just racial disparity, but disparity based on um, socioeconomic opportunities being so different in cultures uh, across disparity due to religious background, educational background, all kinds of things. And then at the other end, you will have people saying, why are we surprised? We've had every indication along the way that we were headed towards um, our current situation. So I think about you journalists and your, 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 um, your community. You are both the reporters on what's happening. You have an extraordinary ability uh, to integrate what's happening now with history. And that puts you on a trajectory to be able to help people see what's coming in the future. So what I'd love to ask you <clears throat> is to kind of tie this all together. Responsibility, should we, should people have been surprised? Would you say this, would you be in the camp saying, oh, people have been writing about this for ages. This is a long time coming. And, um, and then Kevin's question, 
which I think ties in a lot. It's having a centric point of view and not being able to integrate. Have we done a good job of integrating other points of view so we will not be surprised when we discover those points of view? Just to clarify, what is the thing that we're surprised by? It sounded like there was... So some people are surprised. I can't believe we're having a pandemic. I mean, science should have taken care of this. Or, wow, look at all the unrest that's going on. There's so much uh, anger over racial disparities or disparities over wealth. Or um, people who uh, are looking at the fires saying, I can't, I can't believe the fires can get so big. So surprised mm -hmm. like that. Um, where is the responsibility in, in making sure we aren't surprised like that? And or do you think we've done a good job anyway? Well, I, I, I can answer some of these questions in a kind of cohesive <laughs> chain of, of thought, I think. First of all, do, 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 do journalists try and tell stories from the point of view of other cultures? In, in the case of CRISPR, genetic engineering, the, the, the other culture that we need to tell stories from is China, right? Just because of the scope of the investment in dollars and in people. The, the center of mass of this research is moving from the West to the East. So we need to tell stories from that point of view, but it is not easy to interact with scientists in China. I don't speak Chinese, for instance, and I'm not in China. Um, I have been to China and I was hopeful that the similarities of the academic cultures would be that bridge, right? I went to a conference in Shanghai and I was kind of surprised to see the professor there also wearing a tweed coat, also having graduate students and also undergraduates and their goal is to discover something new and get it published in a high profile journal. So I said, I, this is familiar to me. I know what's going on here. And, and so I had a map uh, to, to the extent that they were doing science, I had a map to what they were doing and I could kind of interact with them. Um, the, the interactions between Chinese scientists and American scientists, I think, are being greatly diminished. Uh, the FBI is after, you know, anybody who's like spends too much time in China or collects a paycheck from there. Um, but in the same way, uh, U.S. physicists and Russian physicists got together in their scientific colloquia and discussions to try and sort of help and keep tabs on the whole uh, nuclear proliferation question. I'm, I'm hopeful that there's going to be scientific bridges between the United States and China on the direction of biotechnology and, and on CRISPR. Those bridges are being destroyed now, uh, but we kind of need them more than ever. And do you think journalists are driving, uh, helping to drive that bridge, uh, formation of the bridge? Um, I kind of think it's up to scientists. Uh, you know, they've chained, trained with one another. They, they know one another personally. I think, it, I think it's more up to them. My experience as a journalist, like I said, is, you know, I try and communicate with people in China and, you know, not, I mean, nine times out of 10, there's just no reply at all. Part of it's beyond our, I mean, in our film for Human Nature, <clears throat> we wanted to go to China. We couldn't get in. That we didn't get the approval to do it. Um, so, you know, that makes it very hard in that place to put that voice in. We really wanted to capture that voice. I want to go to a question that's bouncing around from Megan Hawkstra yes. uh, about basically she's the same handful of characters, and I think touches on this, tend to appear over and over again in coverage of CRISPR. How do the panelists think about include one of the usual suspects versus a new voice? You know, when it came time to our film, one of the things we wanted to do was tell the you know, definitive story of the experimental process that led to CRISPR and to go back to Francis Mojica and Rodolf Berengu and others to sort of, so I think for, the, for, for what our approach was the film, it was obvious that we were gonna interview George Church and Jennifer, Jennifer Doudna. Uh, and so, but I do think, and I think one of the reasons why people, and this is another question that came out earlier that I wanna address because I was talking about not having um, extreme voices or sound bites into in, in journalism, and someone asked correctly. You know, we have a in our film a a story from Jennifer where about a dr famous dream that she had about where she imagined Adolf Hitler asking about CRISPR. And why did after I said, well, we should not have you know we should have nuance. Why did we include that? And I think the reason is it gives an insight into her perspective because she has really become a leader in speaking publicly about this. Uh, it's just taken on that responsibility, and we wanted to show. What you know that that scientists themselves are not 
are not immune to the moral implications of of their research and that they are you know members of society but i think it's very very important that we include many many more voices i mean one of the real stars of our film is david sanchez a young boy at that time now now not so young it's, it took a while to make the film uh who uh you know has sickle cell disease and he really tells his story about and his voice uh, in surprising ways about how he feels about having the disease, about what he thinks about treatment and genome editing in general. So I think it's it's incumbent upon journalists to seek out many, many more voices, uh, especially when it comes to the impact. And, it, and also I think in really showing who's doing science. I mean, science, the, the, the science is not just, you know, not being done primarily by senior white male PIs. I mean, it's really a diverse group of students and graduate students, postdocs in labs all around the world and industry. Uh, and that any fair representation, which is, you know, Tamara's saying, you're trying to get to the truth of what we're trying to, has to really include that knowledge, uh, has to really include that representation of who's doing the science. In fact, here's a comment from Joe. I think it fits perfectly. Science is not apolitical and it is not objective. Although the scientific method has been used in some fashion by many people, Native Americans especially, the way that it's utilized in the social sphere is very Western and biased. Native Americans have produced so many crops, crop science, pharmaceutics, uh, pseudicals, and socially grounded mental health, but it's often not recognized or attributed. Rather, it's co-opted and um, relabeled by Western science as their own intellectual property. So, um, Tamara, I know you've really researched food and the origins of all this and from so many um, perspectives. And I, that comment is, I think, strikes home, will strike home for all of us. I guess I, I, I do things a little bit differently from Elliot. Uh, I am not a storyteller, um, I am relentlessly analytical. Ask, ask any of my friends. I can bore people witless at a party faster than anyone you know. And, and I believe that storytelling is a way to communicate science that can be very effective. Um, but it's not the way I do it. Um, I almost feel as though, and I know I'm in a minority about this, and, and I almost feel like storytelling is a kind, what makes it effective is that it is a kind of emotional manipulation. You pull people into the story, you tell them the story, you pick the story that tells the point of view that you are trying to get across. And I feel as though if I am going to persuade my readers of something that is science, um, I'm gonna stick to the science. And you know that's why I have 37 readers. Um, but I, that is the way, that is where I am comfortable and I'm not dissing storytelling by any means. And every now and then I'll even engage in it. But for the most part, I stay away from it partly because my, the way I learn is not that way, but partly because I'm always a little uncomfortable telling other people's stories. Mm. Um, and so I, I sort of retreat to the hardest science that I can find. Um, and, and that's where I stay. But I, let me ask you a question. I mean, isn't, I mean, the data that scientists present, the hard data itself is a story. You know, they are making choices sure, about is. what they're including. They're making choices about mm -hmm. what experiments they're going to do. Uh, some of those choices are dictated mm -hmm. by funding. Some of those are dictated by tenure by publishing, you know, guidelines or sort of, or the, or where a field is heading. So I think that, that storytelling mm -hmm. that, you know, everybody is making choices uh, about where, mm -hmm. what they include and what they don't include, uh, what they do and what they don't do. Sure. And so I think it's really important, I, you know, that scientists themselves recognize that they are storytellers. Uh, what they put in a paper is a story. What they put in a talk is a story. And to and that and there, there, there's a lot of this and, and when they and in fact I would argue that some of the least effective science communication to other scientists is when it's not a story when it's just a long recitation of data points and slides with way too much text and graphs and all that other stuff on them that you know that we need to 
that, that people are making these decisions. And I think that to un that for everybody to understand that that there are subjective decisions that are being made from through all points uh, with our own biases, whether it's in science or journalism. Mm -hmm. And I actually write about exactly that, that, you know, I write in a field, well, we all write in a field where scientists make those kinds of decisions. And sometimes they're simply driven by, you know, ideology. When I get a new study that comes across the transom that shows, you know, people on a low carb diet lost more weight than people on the low fat diet. The first thing I look at is, okay, well, who are the authors? Because I know which authors are in which camp. And the first thing I ask myself is whether there's an ideological investment among the authorship. And any journalist who's covering any field can do exactly the same thing. We all know the points of view of the scientists who do this. And I would totally agree with you that that is part of the science story. And, you know, I guess when, when I say I'm not a storyteller, I mean a very specific thing. I mean, picking up something like um, the guy in your film with sickle cell disease. Um, but obviously there's all kinds of machinations that go on before any paper hits the transom and, and, it's my job to understand those so I can try and cut through um, to, again, focus on what I believe. To I, be I want to jump in quickly because, you know, we talked about criticism. And I'm seeing, I think, I don't want my comments to be misconstrued from some of the comments in here. I think storytelling in science is a really good, I don't mean that, that, that there is, it's a fabulistic endeavor. I think that what it's, what it's mm -hmm. saying is mm -hmm. that the best scientists can see the story in their own research, that they can understand the links that come together, that they understand the, the, the world in which they're living, the contextual world, the research that comes before it, where they want to go. And so I'm not saying this is cherry picking in any way, or what I'm saying is it's just a clarity of thought that, that our human mind thinks in stories. It's been that way across all cultures and that a very successful way to consider one's own biases and one's own research is with the story one is telling. And that I think that, so I want to make sure that's just very clear that I'm not, I, I don't mean that in a negative sense. I don't think we disagree. I think. Yeah. No, we're, no I'm we're, saying that some of the comments, two different I'm just looking at some of the comments and, and, oh, really? and I just wanted to make sure that that, that, that wasn't being misconstrued. I almost wish I could put us on hold so we can all read these comments. They're, they're, they're fantastic comments. Um, so, there are a few, and I apologize to the audience, we won't be able to go through each one that I brought up, it's already been brought up, what drives the questions, of course, is personal, funding drives the questions, et cetera, et cetera. Well, a most recent comment has come in and is talking about how, so I'll read it to you. There's also a question about big data. Big data goes everywhere and sees everything. So we don't have the luxury as scientists to throw our purest hands up as artists and relinquish our responsibility from social accountability. It's the, it's the last question in your chat box. Often journalists enter a weird feedback loop <clears throat> nowadays that is also part of big data and can be manipulated to ensure science, <clears throat> excuse me, gets what it wants. So both scientists and journalists, unwittingly, sometimes not, are exploitive. So, I, we are in a loop of trying to get, I, as a scientist, <clears throat> I need to get funding to support the people in my lab. I am in that loop. We try hard to not exploit, to deliver. Um, I'm curious how all of you feel about journalism and, and the word exploiting, which goes right back to trust. This questioner does say, sometimes not unwittingly, but does put in unwittingly. And is it possible to not exploit at all? I don't think that I understand this question entirely, but it's know. worth rereading it because it, yeah. I, I, you get the sense it's onto something. There, there's another question um, possibly related about which stories uh, don't get covered uh, yeah. and also okay, who doesn't great. get quoted, uh, the fringe views. Journalists spend a lot of time just ignoring people. This is, you know, bad mainstream media. There's all kinds of views we simply ignore because it's just the most efficient way to, 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 to exclude them because they're not worth hearing for whatever reason. It happens all the time. We'll now have other.
services such as Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. Uh, journalists spend a, a lot of their work you never see because of just figuring out who should just be kept off. Stories are not told. Um, I've been thinking more and more just about the money involved in genome editing. I don't think there's been that much coverage of the money part. I mean, there's the patent dispute uh, story, which mm -hmm. got a lot of, but, you know, personal fortunes that are being made. And so sometimes I wonder, you know, maybe I should cover that. It just seems rude. Uh, you know, I'm approaching a scientist like Elliot May, you know, and I, and I want to hear about the science and it's someone very important and illustrious. Uh, and it would seem, you know, not too classy to ask about their uh, bank account, but it might be relevant because a lot of money is involved. These startup companies, you know, it's millions and millions of dollars. So that's something that's not covered uh, and could be. I, I think anything to increase the conversation and the trust, because it's not just information going to the general public. We really rely on opinions coming back, questions coming back. Um, the, the eyes of 7 billion people is the best experiment you can have for gathering data. It is a two-way street, but it will only be two-way if there's trust for people to want to talk to us. So yeah, I think if you think that's an issue, definitely, I think, cover that. Um, I'm looking at the clock. It's 1223. I think we were told at 1225 we need to come, we need to be closed down because I think our organizers have some words. So um, I'm going to apologize to the audience, but you know who these panelists are, so I'm sure you can write them, let them know how you uh, heard about them. I thought I should end very quickly so everyone just gets a like less than a minute to answer really quickly. I have wondered whether there was, so I'm going back to anecdotes, a time when you were interviewing someone and you had a question at the tip of your tongue and you decided not to ask it, and today, you really wish you had asked that question, maybe for your career, maybe because society needed it or, or whatever. So um, we'll end with that. Um, and it has to do with helping the audience understand how you make these decisions when you interview. So, and if you don't like that question, you can answer another one. Yeah, since I was already talking, I'll just, if you don't mind, I'll just go first with the answer and then give the floor to Tamar. you know scoops that end up on the page there's many that you just missed right there's a lot of close misses and so often i look back and for some reason or another maybe i, I failed to make that extra phone call uh failed to put the effort in the shoe leather in uh to get the information so um, that's that's experience that 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 I have most often is if, you know, if only I had taken the time to stake out somebody's office or if only I had called this other person, then the final fact would have been fit in. Um, so I have that regret. Uh, Interesting. I guess I, I don't have an answer to that one because one of the things I learned really early in journalism is to always ask the question. <laughs> and I, I think that that we all develop the the skill of being able to ask questions that could be viewed as you know antagonistic um in a way that hopefully gets people to think and elicits a response that's useful but in all of my experience i don't think i've ever insulted anybody with a question and i've always asked the questions that i that I wanted the answers to. And if I forget one, I'll call them back. <laughs> it's like, that's one thing that, that that I'll be relentless about. I guess, I mean, Elliot. this is sort of a, a different take on this, but it was very early in my career. I was doing a documentary on cruise missile technology and, 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 um, and I was interviewing James Schlesinger who had been Secretary of Defense under Nixon. And I was sort of intimidated. I was very early on and it was, uh, in Washington and his offices and we sat down there and I was sort of had my notebook with all my notes and he was sort of sat opposite me and he sort of said, okay, Elliot, fire away, ask me anything you want. And I, I had there for a brief moment, I wanted to, it was a fierce sort of anti-communist or a cold warrior. And I, I had this notion that I was going to ask, are you now, or have you ever been a member of the communist party? 
as, as a way of either breaking the ice or having him throw me out. Uh, and I, I, for like a split second, I thought maybe I will do this and I decided against it and probably, probably to the better, but, uh, I don't know. I don't know what kind of story I would have had. So I, sometimes I wonder, you know, looking back now after all these years, whether I would have had the guts to ask him that. That's really funny. But, you know, I, I, I know I have to come to a close. I just want to say as a scientist, you are lots of times our spokespersons and you uh, are more able to hear what people want to know. I love the questions that you asked. Tamar, in our lab, we basically say, you know, our lab meetings, are, it's like we're sitting around a campfire. No one holds back anything. And I agree with you. It never actually backfires. Um, so I really wish you had asked that question, Elliot. I don't know. It might have been the end of the interview. You got to you gotta get, I had a lot, I had a lot resting on that interview. So That's funny. I think, Antonio, when, uh, when your call comes in, people answer. So um, I look forward to uh, hearing, hearing more about your questions, reading your work. And thank you very much for being on this panel. And um, now I want to thank the our organizers and hand this conversation back and well, with thanks to the audience. Okay. <laughs> Hello again, and, and thanks to everyone for joining today. Um, on behalf of Keystone Policy Center, I wanna thank our panelists and moderators. So thank you, Ting, Anthony, Elliot, and Tamar. Also, um, thank you again to our partner for the session, Innovative Genomics Institute, and to our sponsors and, and advisors listed on CRISPRCon.org. Um, wholeheartedly, thanks to the audience for tuning in, listening, and contributing your questions and comments. Uh, we really appreciated uh, your perspectives shared uh, through chat, and we hope to continue to engage you uh, through the rest of the week and through the rest of CRISPRCon over the next two months. So just a few notes and reminders as we close out. Uh, if you could just take a moment to help us understand who tuned in today, that would also be appreciated. Um, today's panel session will be available on our YouTube channel and our website in short order. Um, our next panel is Thursday, September 3rd, this Thursday, September 3rd at 3 p.m. Eastern. For this upcoming session, we've partnered with the Native Biodata Consortium for a panel that will focus on indigenous perspectives on gene editing in health and agriculture. Um, also on Thursday, we have an ideas marketplace occurring following Thursday's panel discussion. And this offers participant-led small group discussions on various topics related to our week's theme, science and societal narratives. We encourage all participants to join a small group discussion, carry on the conversation. And we also encourage you to lead a table discussion if you'd like. You can find out more at crispercon.org. Also just a reminder of, of content that continues through the week. Although this concludes our live content for today, you're all invited to explore other areas of the conference, which remain open until Thursday. So you can stay in the Hopin platform, meet fellow attendees through the People tab or use the networking feature to have a virtual coffee break and get connected with someone else by video. The expo is available, which includes background information um, on our partners, our sponsors, past CRISPRCon content related to the theme of this week. Um, you can also continue the dialogue on Twitter at hashtag CRISPRCon2020. And please be sure to register for future CRISPRCon 2020 virtual events coming up now through October. So thanks again to all who have participated today. Please carry on the conversation and thanks. <laughs>